So I'd like to welcome everybody to tonight's Bible study. You're not going to double me up again, eh? Far from a double. Sorry. Welcome to Foundational Bible Teachings. Jesus accuses them of being aligned with the devil. Walk into a church, go to a preacher, you've listened, you've heard what he had to say, which is contrary to scripture, and you tell them these same words that Jesus spoke. You will get kicked out. Or if they're a little bit on the nut side, they're going to grab you and they're going to open the door with your head and they're going to throw you out. Okay, so now that we got everybody taken out of the scene over here, we're ready to go. A problem in the churches today is opposing doctrinal positions. One says it's white, the other guy says it's black, and everybody's right. So why does this problem exist? Reason number one, lack of study of God's word. People just speak through their hat. Reason number two, most doctrines are taken out of their biblical context. And this is the mess that we have in Christianity today. Paul basically gave it to Timothy and he says to him, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. As a new believer, besides praying, daily reading of your Bible, studying is the next greatest pillar of your spiritual growth and stability. Jesus is your foundation. Take heed, watch out how you're going to build on this foundation. This is your responsibility. You're going to be getting a lot of information coming in from the internet, TV, radio, books, pamphlets, you name it, from your friends. Everybody wants a piece of you. It's your responsibility to know what's true and what's not true. So you want to be approved of God? Study His Word. Develop a systematic habit of studying God's Word. The way that I study, I ask a question and then I go out and I find the answers. Some questions are very light, very easy, you find the answers. I find the answers fairly quickly. Some of the other questions that I may have are more heavier, they're more meaty, so there's more research involved. There I might be calling people up to say, hey, how does this work? I might call different people from different denominations to find out what's the temperature out there. Once I get all of this information, I go back to the scriptures. And like a judge, I piece everything together and the Holy Spirit will guide you into all truth. And believe me, that's true. So every question that you have deserves an answer, no matter how trivial that question may be. If you have a question, ask, don't be shy. If someone laughs at you or ridicules you, like it's already happened to me in the past, get away from them because they're going to be a hindrance to your spiritual growth. Get away from those people. Now, a sad realization is that many today in the churches aren't approved of God because of their lack of study. And I'm talking about the hundreds of millions of so-called believers or so-called Christians out there. You show them a picture of an elbow and a knee, they won't know the difference. You're asking them a biblical question, it's 25, 30 years that you're in a church and you can't answer a simple question, there's something wrong with you. So many aren't approved of God because the commandment to study is not even found in their Bibles. So why study? It's not there so I don't have to study. This commandment to study, His Word is given to us from God. This word study, quote unquote, has been taken out of 93.1% of the Bibles. Now, where did I get this number? I checked 29 versions, English versions and foreign language versions. Only three of them had the commandment to study. And even the New King James does not have the word study in it. So this is very concerning to me. Why? Because the state of the body of Christ is divided and broken into hundreds of different factions. It was never meant to be this way. The body of Christ was to, according to Paul in Ephesians 4.13, to come to the unity of the faith. Notice the word unity. Now the only commandment given in the entire Bible, given to us to study, is taken out of the versions out there, making them a perversion of God's Word. Now you may find the word perversion a little bit heavy, or maybe a little bit hard. I don't think it's hard enough. It's pretty mild compared to what Jesus said. Did you guys ever read Matthew chapter 23? He basically hits him this way, this way, he aims between the eyes and he's taken no prisoners. Satan messed with God's word ever since the beginning and he's still at it. He's more vehement now than when he first started. God said in Genesis 2.17, But of the tree of knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eats thereof thou shalt surely die. It's pretty clear. Now that old serpent comes around and he says in Genesis 3.4, And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. God says you're going to die, the serpent says you're not going to die. What Satan did, what Satan said, is still going on in the churches today. Jesus Christ is not God, but I just showed you a verse where He is God. God was manifest in the flesh. Yes, but you know, and then they start explaining why that's not it. 
The only thing I can say to this is you piece of filth. Anybody that's going to imitate this particular falsehood where God says something and you're going to come against what God said, you're basically a Satanist. You're a propagator of that continuing attack on God's word. If Satan did it and you're doing it, put two and two together. Every religion, sect, every denomination or whatever group is out there, they're going to say, teach or preach anything that's contrary to the scriptures. Satan did it. If you're doing it, you're under his influence. I don't care how you slice that cake. Are these hard words? Absolutely not. Didn't Jesus say that you are of your father the devil? So turn with me now to John 8, 44. Jesus says, you are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth. Because there is no truth in him, when he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own. For he is a liar, and the father of it. Who did Jesus refer to when he said, you are of your father the devil? Who is he talking about? He was talking and referring to the Jewish leaders of Israel, who were opposing him and everything that he was saying. These were the same men who led Israel in spiritual decadence, which landed every one of their followers in hell. The spiritual decadence still continues with us today. That spirit is still around. The majority of those that followed after the Pharisees and Sadducees parted from the truth. They went away from what Jesus Christ was saying and rejected the teachings of the Word made flesh. So Jesus accuses them of being aligned with the devil. Walk into a church, go to a preacher, you've listened, you've heard what he had to say, which is contrary to scripture, and you tell him these same words that Jesus spoke. You will get kicked out. Or if they're a little bit on the nut side, they're going to grab you and they're going to open the door with your head and they're going to throw you out. This is what's going on in the churches. I've been in a few of these churches. So Jesus accuses them of being spiritually aligned with the devil, describing the devil as their father. Oh, my friend, that's hitting them this way and then this way. And then following after the devil. This statement reflects Jesus' rebuke of their opposition to the truth. He is God. He is the one that put the words in the scriptures, in the Torah. And all of a sudden, they're going against what he's saying. I wrote the book. No, no, it's like this. Are you for real? And how many churches, how many preachers out there are like that? How many teachers are out there like that? And the mentality today is rampant all over the place. How could Jesus speak? like this to these respected and established religions in Israel. Easy, the respected and established religions literally went against the words God communicated to us. This is where God is basically up their hind tail. Jesus called these respected established religions blind leaders in Matthew 15, 14. Let them alone, they be blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. Who is he talking about? He's talking about the preachers and teachers. He's talking about the evangelists. They have the Bible in their hands, and yet what's coming out of their mouth is contrary to the book that they're actually holding. That is disgusting to the highest heaven. This same spirit of opposition that was in Jesus' day is still with us today. The members of the spiritual opposition contradict God's truths. Read the narratives of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Jesus attacked the religious leaders of Israel. If he would be here today, oh, what he would do. The scribes, the Pharisees back in Jesus' day, the Sadducees, the lawyers, are represented today in spirit through the different denominations throughout so-called Christianity. So where you say, have you walked into the churches today? Have you seen the spirit of sectarianism thriving in their ranks? These have all the truth and everybody else is wrong. Every denomination is right, but they're all contradicting themselves. How does this work? It doesn't make sense. That's why a lot of people want nothing to do with Christianity. But once you get in and you start going through that mess, now I understand what's happening. So these have all the truth and everybody else is wrong. Every denomination is a team against the other denomination. Is this what Paul wanted? Is this what Paul wrote in the scriptures? Absolutely not. Tell me, the Roman Catholic Church, the Anglicans, the Presbyterians, the Reformed, the Baptists, the Pentecostals, the Brethren, the Jehovah's Witnesses, the Apostolic, Christian Science, Assemblies of God, United Church of Christ, Episcopal Church, Seventh-day Adventism, Charismatic, Methodist, Lutheran, Presbyterian, Latter-day Saints, which are the Mormons, United Pentecostals, Messianic Congregations, and etc. I could have made this list like 16 pages long. And tell me that this is the body of Christ. Absolutely not.
So should Jesus walk into the so-called churches today, which do you think he would literally blow out of the water like he did back in his day? And you're sitting in one of these congregations. What is the guy up there telling you? Did you go search the scriptures? Did you guys read Acts 17.11? Are you applying Acts 17.11? Are you applying 2 Timothy 2.15? And if you're not, shame on you. Because the responsibility of what you believe is on you, not on the guy in front. Sh can come out of my mouth. And if you guys are swallowing hook, line, and sinker, you're going to smell like I smell. That's not nice. So for me, sitting there says, you know what, this guy's wrong. I'm going to go talk to the guy. The guy doesn't want to hear nothing. I'll get up and I'll leave. Why are you leaving? You tell them why you're leaving. You know how much crap is up there behind the pulpit? It is filled. Most people are up there because there's a lot of money to be made in the God business. A lot of them are doing it for a job. A lot of them are not even saved. If you're blind to that, like Jesus said, he's blind, you're blind, and you're both going to fall into the ditch. So as Jesus blew the Pharisees, the Sadducees, out of the water, did you guys read in Revelation 2 and 3? Jesus had something against all the churches except one. I went to a church, if Jesus himself would show up, he would get literally kicked out. And I know this for a fact. And yet these people are holy rollers. It's just incredible. So much so that it got me sick that I had to get out. The actual body of Christ does not have a name. They asked me, what's the name of your church here? I don't have a name. If you guys go check the first videos that we made, I said, you're going to call it Frank's Bible Study. I don't have a name. I'm part of the body of Christ. The minute you have a name, you become a team against everybody else. What I say is going to go against everybody else, and it's not supposed to be like that. We're supposed to have one body, one faith, one baptism. But it's not like that. And that's why Christianity is upside down. And it's going to get worse, boys and girls. I can guarantee you that much. But the body of Christ is not divided like we see out there. The members of the body of Christ are united in spirit and they edify each other. The minute that you start fighting against each other, that's not the body of Christ anymore. You got the guts to call yourself by the name of the Lord? Go hide under a rock. Let me know what rock it is so I could put a bigger one on top of it so you never crawl out from under that rock. That disgusts me to, uh, to high heaven. What did Paul say in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 3? Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Is that what's happening in the churches? Absolutely not. To endeavor means to make an effort, to make an attempt. They're not even making the attempt. Everybody is right. Is that what the Lord wanted? Absolutely not. To keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. They're not doing that. What unity? What bond of peace? I don't see it out there. There's no endeavoring going on whatsoever. All denominations are at war with each other. Everyone is defending their so-called truths. Notice that I said their quote-unquote. Whatever happened to our truth? No, they're defending their truth, whatever it is. Truth is exclusive. There's only one truth. You cannot have two truths. This is not the body of Christ. Paul gave the definition of it, which we just started reading in verse 3. Let's keep reading in verse 4. There is one body. There's supposed to be one body, one body of believers, and one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. I don't see this today. Everybody has their own definition of baptism. Everybody has their own definition of salvation. It's not supposed to be like that. Verse 6, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through you all and in you all. Now let's continue. Have you seen the different religious forum platforms out there? Many members are so cocky, prideful, and arrogant, and so full of themselves. If you read some of the comments or some of the answers that they give, it's just beyond me. They just redefine stupidity to the nth power. Now their answers to biblical questions are taken out of their immediate and biblical context. This is what screws the whole thing up. This is one of the biggest ways to misunderstand scripture, to unconfuse yourself. Ask yourself, who wrote what to who? Jesus is speaking in Matthew 24. Who is he speaking to? Who is he speaking about? He's not speaking about the church, but that's another Bible study. I see those believers who take time to answer these people, to answer their questions and doctrines, and yet these people answering, they're the dumb ones. IQ 7.5 will not even regard, not even go check what the other guys wrote. They spew out their garbage and you don't need to talk to me because I already know what it is. Really? Who told you that? Your mother. Go hide under her apron. IQ 7.5 does not have the Berean spirit. And I'm talking to millions of you out there. They are right and everybody else is wrong. These are the people that are puffed up in pride and arrogance, knowing everything, and there's no more room to actually learn anything else. Did you even consider that you might be wrong? 
You know why I'm saying that? I used to be part of that group, cocky and arrogant, until I got slammed into the wall a few times. The Lord basically got me in the corner a few times and says, you, I'm going to have to smarten you up to the point where he had to humble me to say, take your time, buddy. Take your time. Listen to what he's saying. Is it true what he's saying? Go check it with the scriptures. I've given you a handbook. Go check it. You're not sure? Ask questions. Get on your knees. You pray. I've sent the Holy Ghost to guide you into all truth. There is only one truth. Paul saw this disastrous mess coming and he even warned of it. So what does Paul say in Acts chapter 20 and verse 29? We'll start reading there. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Look at the church today. They haven't spared the flock. They got in and they just devastated everything. Verse 30. Also of your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Thus a million and six denominations. Verse 31. Therefore watch, open your eyes. God gave you a brain, he expects you to use it. And remember, by the space of three years I ceased not to warn everyone night and day with tears because he knew what was going to happen. Didn't Paul warn of lies and deceptions and false teachings, even coming from those who appear to be good godly men, quote unquote. That's the magic word. They appear, they look like nice people. They dress well, they got the nice suits, they've got the ties, they've got the speech. I never wanted to be on YouTube because I don't speak like them. I am not of that caliber and I never wanted to be of that caliber. I find there's a lot of hypocrisy that goes on at that level and I'm not talking about everybody. There's a lot of good preachers out there. What did Paul say in 2 Corinthians chapter 11? We'll start reading in verse 13. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. What does it mean, transforming themselves? They look like nice people because the apostles were nice people. So they're transforming themselves like the apostles on the outside. But on the inside, like Jesus said, they're full of dead men's bones. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is where the unsuspecting listener swallows the proverbial hook, line, and of course the sinker. Oh no, not me. Oh no, not my church. You know how many times I heard that? Why don't you read the next verse? And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. How many people have got duped? I got suckered in, everybody gets suckered in. And don't think that you're on top of it all. Because eventually, without realizing it, you're going to slip, stumble, and you're going to fall. Having said this now, Satan has his ministers ministering in the body of Christ. I repeat, Satan has his ministers ministering or operating in the body of Christ. Remember the song, Devil in Disguise? You look like an angel, you talk like an angel, you walk like an angel, but I got wise. You're the devil in disguise, or oh, yes you are. What's the song saying? You want to get wise? You want to open your eyes? Who is pulling the wool over whose eyes? Maybe they're pulling it over your eyes. It's up to you, it's your responsibility to open your eyes and know what you're supposed to believe. Don't believe the words coming out of this mouth, that it's from this group over here or out there. There. I am not the final authority. The scriptures are. I may have misunderstood something. Maybe there's some doctrine that I still didn't understand perfectly yet. I speak with what I've studied. And if the day comes, which already happened many times, and somebody shows me a clearer way, right away, I take out the old that I used to believe and I'll take in the new. But before I take in the new, I'm going to go search the scriptures. Remember Acts chapter 17 verse 11. Don't forget that. Look at verse 15. Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers, I repeat, Therefore, it's no great thing if his, talking about Satan's ministers, also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. Under whose spiritual table are your feet tucked under? You guys here, your feet are tucked under my table. I have a responsibility towards you. I'm getting it from the Lord. I am not the Pope. But if you go check it out and it's exactly what I said and you find it in the scriptures, then that's what it is. Paul said, be followers of me as I am of Christ. If the day comes where you see me departing from Christ, it's the time that you depart from me. And if I'm talking about me, I'm talking about all the million and six denominations out there. Oh no, not me, not my preacher. Really? There's an old Italian proverb that says, Quando il diavolo ti accarezza, la tua anima che vuole. And basically this means when the devil caresses you, it's your soul that he wants. He's going to give you nice things so he can sucker you in. How do you sucker in a child? By giving them a candy. How do you sucker somebody in? By telling them how beautiful they are. How many women basically get seduced by men because they know the words that they have to say to get to their feelings and emotions? And then they fall. And then what? What did Paul say in Galatians? 
Revelation chapter 1, start reading in verse 6. I marvel, I'm freaking out, I can't believe it, that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ, unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you, that would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. This implies divine judgment and condemnation for those who distort or pervert the true message of the gospel. To be accursed, he's basically throwing you in hell. What about Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 14? That we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the sleight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Paul is saying, don't be bounced around like a ball. Know what the doctrine is. Be solid on it. What did Paul say in 1 Timothy chapter 1, start reading in verse 3. And I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus, when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. That means there's only one. Neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies, which minister questions, rather than godly edifying, which is in faith, so do. In the next letter, Paul says to Timothy in 2 Timothy 4.3, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. That's today. But after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. Verse 4. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth. You may be speaking all the truth in the world, but they will not be wanting to listen to you. Because the truth sometimes hurts. And people don't want to be hurt today. They're a bunch of thin-skinned sissies. You say something and it offends them. You got to watch out what you say because you're going to hurt their feelings. My, I'll give you a backhander. And shall be turned onto fables. These passages reflect Paul's concerns about false teachings, deceptive practices, and the need for vigilance within the body of Christ. They emphasize the importance of holding fast to a genuine gospel and being alert to potential distortions and deceptions. Everyone is using this particular passage to prove that they're right and that they have the truth and everybody else is wrong. Yeah, me too. I can take this verse and I can say the same thing about you. But in the end, if you're saying white and I'm saying black, only one of us is right. That's why the only commandment given to us in the scriptures is study. Why would Satan want to get that commandment out of the Bible? So you don't study. So you can stay nice and dumb. Now this is very concerning, especially to somebody who just got saved. So who's right, you're probably thinking. Remember, you just got saved. Truth is exclusive. There's only one truth out there. And truth does not fear examination. I welcome people to come and, and test me. And if what you're saying is right, I'm jumping from my foundation to your foundation. We are there to edify one another. We are there to help one another. We are not there to bring the other person down. It doesn't work like that. That is not part of the body of Christ. When Jesus says a new commandment they give unto you is to love one another. Paul took it and he says you got to love one another. See how many times Paul said in his letters to love one another. I learned the hard way to keep the cement of my biblical belief wet. I never know when I'm going to have to change a belief that I held on for even 20, 30 years. And somebody says, you're wrong because of, hey, you know what? I never saw that before. I can take it out because the cement is wet. Did you ever try, you plant a post in wet cement, it becomes dry. Try to take that post out. You ain't going to do it. But because my cement is wet and I've got a whole bunch of these posts, the guy says that one over there is crooked. I take it out and I can plant another one because my cement is basically still wet. Like the Bereans, I search the scriptures to know what it teaches. I receive comments like, this is all in capital letters, so this person is actually screaming at me. How many of you are willing to be deceived? Satan is counting on you to believe in this false teaching, talking about me. This man is a false teacher. I wish you were in front of my face. Wow, who died and made you Pope? Who died and made you judge, jury, and executioner? You're coming out even after a short and you've got the guts to say that? So IQ 7.5, he seems to have all the answers becoming the standard by which everybody else is supposed to be judged by. You just became the standard. What happened to the scriptures? Do you know what my biblical stance is and why I believe it? Do you know that I try to look at both sides of the questions of the doctrine? Then and only then I do make my informed decision as a judge does after he hears the case, after studying it. And this is the way we're supposed to be studying scripture. You could be wrong. I could be wrong. Anybody could be wrong. But if a brother in the Lord comes up and he corrects you, listen to what he's saying. Do you know what Acts 17 
1911 says? Maybe you should do your homework and just go check what that says. As a side note, this guy mentions dispensationalism, which is tied into the uh, pre-tribulational rapture, in the 1800s is a false teaching. Okay, so what do we do with Irenaeus 165 AD? What do we do with Tertullian 185 AD? Writing about the different aspects of dispensationalism. What do we do with these guys? What about Ephraimus, the Syrian, who wrote in 373 AD about the pre-trib rapture? This is approximately 1400 years before the 1800s. So who's deceiving who? This guy also said, in capital letters, you better read Matthew 24 carefully. I did. The context is Israel, not the church. Taking information given to Israel and jamming it down the church's throat. Is that how you're reading scripture? Because you read the word elect, that is the church. What do we do with the 15, 20 other prophecies in the Old Testament tied into the elect of Matthew 24? You just destroyed your Bible. You just destroyed a doctrine right there. And that's the church. Why don't you do a little bit more studying yourself? Now, why am I telling you all of this? If I hadn't studied, I would be believing what IQ 7.5 just finished saying because I don't know. When I got saved, the amount of that was given to me, that it was fed down my throat. I took it hook, line, and sinker. But as I grew and as I matured in the Lord, wait a minute, the guy said this. Wait a minute, this just contradicts that. The guy fed me a lie. So what do I do? I take that out and I start incorporating this one. That's why it's important for you to study. So after studying the question, let's say Matthew 24, I'm going to use that as an example. He turns out to be a deceiver and a liar and not me because I did my homework. And if you think I'm wrong, show me where I'm wrong. Show me that the elect in Matthew 24 is actually speaking about the church. Like I said before, who is speaking? Jesus Christ. Who is he speaking to? Peter, James, and John. What are the three questions that they ask him in verse 3? What's the answer that Jesus Christ is giving? Matthew 24 is Jewish. Now, twisting is good if you're going to be dancing to it, but it's not good if you're going to be studying the Bible. Why am I going off like this? Basically, as a new believer, or if you're an older believer, you need to study to know. As Peter said, be ready to give an answer and back it up. Your truth, quote unquote, eventually it will be challenged. Either it will stand or it will crumble. If Paul was challenged in Acts chapter 17 verse 11, so will you. I don't know about you, but uh, personally, I don't want to look like an idiot if ever I'm in a discussion. If you say something that I'm not sure, all of a sudden you see Frank shutting up. I never knew about this. I'm going to go back and check it out. So the first reason to study your Bible is to get to know what is the truth of the whole matter. What is it? Truth, as you already know, is exclusive. Either it is or it ain't. It can't be any other way. So tell me, which of the following biblical doctrines is true? Remember, both can't be true. You ready? We're going down another slide now. Amillennialism or premillennialism. Amillennialism interprets the millennium in a non-literal symbolic sense versus premillennialism believes in a literal thousand year reign of Christ. Arminianism or Calvinism? Which one is right? Calvinism emphasizes predestination and God's sovereignty in salvation versus Arminianism emphasizes free will and human choice. Which one is right? Both can't be right. Eternal security versus conditional security. Meaning, eternal security asserts that once you're saved, you're always saved, you can't lose your salvation. Or conditional security believes salvation can be lost based on one's actions. Salvation is conditional upon the continued faith and obedience. In other words, believers must persevere in faith and good works to maintain, I repeat, to maintain their salvation, thus a salvation sustained by works. What about dispensationalism or covenant theology? That's a biggie. What you believe is going to bring you down two completely different roads. Dispensationalism divides history into distinct administrations versus covenant theology sees a unified covenant of grace throughout history. Both can't be right. Salvation. By faith only, by works only, by faith and works. You have to be part or a member of a particular church to be saved. The rapture. Is it pre, mid, or is it post? Ah, you Christians are on drug. There is no rapture. Which one is right? Trinitarianism or Unitarianism? The Godhead is triadic, meaning there are three natures or entities within it, or God is monotheistic. There is only one God, one personality. What about church in Israel? The church is an entity separate from the nation of Israel, or the church is spiritual Israel. It just transformed itself. One is right, both can be right. The deity of Jesus Christ and the deity of the Holy Ghost. Are they God or not? People are basically in both camps. Preterism or Futurism? Preterism interprets certain biblical prophecies as already fulfilled. 
preterists, versus futurism sees them as yet unfulfilled. Limited atonement versus unlimited atonement. Limited atonement holds that Christ's atonement is for the select few. Only a few people could be saved. That is the elect only. Versus unlimited atonement believes Christ's atonement is for all etc etc and etc what about how do you read your bibles literal interpretation versus allegorical interpretations literal interpretation takes the bible at face value as you read it that's what it is unless the context deems it otherwise versus allegorical interpretation seeks symbolic or metaphorical meanings it says this but it actually means this pass me the acid i might start believing you because you're starting to make sense after i take like two hits of acid out of everything i just said how do you know which one is right. Go to Acts 17 11. These people in Berea, they were more noble than then in Thessalonica in that they received the word which Paul was speaking with all readiness of mind. They took in every word, every comma, every period, but they didn't stop there. And this is where the problems in the churches are. They take everything in and they stop it over there. And that's why the churches are upside down. They received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily. Whether those things were so, they went back and they went and studied. You have to study to know which one. Only one is the right answer. Only one is the truth. Both can't be the truth. Again, 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Study to show thyself approved. I'm going to stop it there. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 19. For there must also be heresies among you, that they which are approved, they that have studied, may be made manifest among you. This is basically how we edify one another. If I miss something, you pick it up. If you miss something, I pick it up. So what's the principle? Hear what the other person has to say. Listen to everything. Read whatever is on the post. Listen to what they're saying. Take everything in. Don't start judging because you already got a preconceived bias. Don't go there because your preconceived bias could be wrong. So once I heard everything that you had to say, I want you to hear this loud and clear. Go check it out. What do the scriptures have to say in biblical context? In these last days, there's more and more of a tendency of differing doctrinal positions. And uh, people say, well, we have to agree to disagree. Are you nuts? This saying is used to acknowledge that two parties have different opinions or perspectives on a particular biblical doctrine. And instead of continuing to hash it out by discussing the question more carefully and completely in order to reach an agreement or deciding on a consensus of what is and what isn't, they agree not to resolve the disagreement but to accept each other's differing views. Are you for real? Just that I have to say. You agree not to resolve the disagreement agreement but to accept each other's differing views. This, they say, is a cordial way of maintaining respect and understanding in spite of different opinions. And he believes this and I believe that and the other guy believes something else. We should all respect what our opinions are. Are you on drugs? What body of Christ are you in? You're not in the body of Christ that Jesus Christ hung on that cross for. In my opinion, you're totally off your rocker and you better go get it checked. Maintaining what? Respect and understanding. Ask Adam and Eve if they had respect to the serpent's view of God's word after they got shafted and death came into the world. Agreed to disagree. Get out of my face. This is the lamest, the laziest, and the most indifferent way to evade the doctrinal questions. Hey man, you have to understand, you may be in error and you come in with this cocky attitude. The Lord is probably saying, come over here, I'm going to give you one in the back of the head. Not me, because he's going to hit harder. Again, you can be in error. What about Adam and Eve? Weren't they in error? They ended up taking the other guy's opinion. And what happened? Death and hell came into the world. And that's the best that you can come up with. We have to agree to a disagree. Don't fall for this diversionary trap. Your error can cost you your eternal life with God. That's what happened with Adam and Eve. The next person to tell me that I have to agree to disagree, I think I'm going to clock them. Agree to disagree. I don't have to agree with you. If you can't answer my questions, you're dead wrong, not me. If I'm wrong, you show me where. Why am I vehement about this? One conversation I had a few years back, I go, I can't believe it. You're in doctrinal error. I've pulled out all the verses. I took 17 hours of my life to come up and make a hole in water. I wasted my time. It's like, well, this is crazy. Agree to disagree. And I never forgot those words. And every once in a while I hear that. So to conclude, 
By studying God's Word, you'll get to know God better. You'll get to know yourself better through God's eyes. You'll get to know how to fight and resist your flesh. You'll get to know the enemy of your soul, who he is, how he tempts us, how to fight and resist him, and how he's going to end up. You'll get to know the spiritual battle that has been raging since the serpent entered into the garden and the havoc that he's been creating ever since. In Revelation chapter 20 and verse 2 it says, And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan. So the serpent in Genesis 3 was the devil himself, and bound him a thousand years. If you're studying God's Word, you'll find perfect peace. You're going to find guidance, wisdom, hope, true love. You're going to find salvation, forgiveness. You're going to find purpose. You're going to find character. It's going to make you a better person. Faith, courage, compassion, humility, holiness, perseverance. Your source of joy is going to come from studying God's Word. You're also going to get eternal life. Guys, I'm going to end it up over here. God gave you the book. He gave you a brain. He expects you to use it. Study. This is your foundational pillar for you to grow and be stabilized with. And if you want eternal life, I want you to watch this video. It's only going to take you three minutes. It's going to be the best three minutes that you've ever spent in all of your life. May the Lord guide you, keep you. May the Lord bring us here next week. Better still, I pray that He just comes back this week and that we don't have to get together next week. Amen. 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 There you go.